Good evening. Welcome back. Thank you so much for joining us in our Daniel Bible study. We are super excited to have you with us tonight. We are in Daniel chapter 10. We're in session uh, 15 of our Bible study, but we are in the, the book of Daniel chapter 10. Uh, and we're going to pick up our second week on the topic of spiritual warfare. So grab your notes, grab your Bible, grab something to write with. You're not going to want to miss tonight. God has a very special message for you. If you're joining us for the first time, we, was, we want to say thank you so much for joining us. You can go to our website, which is whitestonechurchtx.com, whitestonechurchtx.com. You can go to the video drop-down, go to Daniel Session 19 or Part nine, uh, 15, I'm sorry, Part 15, and you can download our notes uh, so you could have those for tonight. If you want to uh, send us your email, we'll be happy to deliver those directly to your inbox uh, every Tuesday afternoon before the Bible study. Uh, so grab your Bible. We're going to dive into Daniel chapter 10 and the topic of spiritual warfare. So Father God, bless our time tonight. Uh, God, we pray that you would open up your scripture, Holy Spirit, uh, to allow us to see what we can't see, to hear what we can't hear, and to know what we can't know, God, that we would supernaturally have our eyes and ears and minds open to your truth and your word and your reality. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. If you look at the front page of your, of your study notes tonight, there's a comment uh, uh, that I just want to read. We are in possession of the message, the Bible, of extraterrestrial origin. We're in pos possession of a message from extraterrestrial origin, it portrays us as an object of an unseen supernatural warfare. Our, extra, our eternal destiny depends upon our relationship with the winner of this cosmic conflict. What is your readiness for this encounter? I want to read it one more time. We are in possession of a message, your Bible, of extraterrestrial origin. It portrays us as objects of an unseen supernatural warfare. Our eternal destiny depends upon our relationship with the winner of this cosmic conflict. What is your readiness for this encounter? The Bible is an extraterrestrial message from outside our time domain. God is not bound by time. He's not bound by the reality of start and finish as you and I are. God can go in and out of time. He's in and out of our, ex, uh, of our past, our present, and our future. As we um, discuss the, the, the Bible and its, and its origin, God wrote the Word of God outside of our time constraint. And so what I mean by that, uh, and, and Chuck Missler does a really good job in teaching about this, what, what is meant by that is that the Bible was written by, by 40 different authors, 60 books over the course of 15, or 66 books over the course of 1,500 years. Many of the authors that, that wrote the Bible did not even live in the same time period. Uh, Isaiah did not live in the same time period as Moses, or uh, uh, Daniel, the book of Daniel, did not uh, exist or live in the same time period as the uh, uh, author of Joshua. Uh, the book of Ruth was not written in the same time period as the book of First and Second Corinthians. So many of the authors did not even live in the same time period, much less know each other, just some uh, fair, as many would say. But this was written by God. It's a message from God to us. It is written to us to understand. And so if the devil tries to confuse you or tries to make you believe that you can't understand the Word of God, that is very first tactic of spiritual warfare. So there is natural warfare and there is supernatural warfare. Physical or natural warfare, we're very accustomed to, we're very cognizant of that. Many of you uh, uh, have served in, in war or know a, a loved one that served in war who physically went to a real battle on planet Earth. Natural warfare is very different than supernatural warfare. As Christians, we've got to grasp the fact that we are in a battle. We are in a supernatural battle between two kingdoms. The kingdom of heaven, or the kingdom of light, or the kingdom of hell, 
the kingdom of darkness. <clears throat> when Jesus came in, the Bible says the world rejected the light, the light of the kingdom of God, because it loved darkness. One of the first battles that we as believers have overcome in the supernatural is the battle that we have given up our love for darkness, our love for sin, our propensity, our desire for that. Now, we still fight that. We still wage that war daily in the flesh. But at some point, if, you, if Christ Jesus rules and reigns in your heart, you've received him as your Savior, and the light of the gospel, the light of the kingdom of God shone inside the dark crevices of your soul, where we used to all be about drugs, sex, and rock and roll, God says, hey, listen, I've got a better way. I've got a better life for you. And so when we look at spiritual warfare, I want our eyes to be open so that we can grasp what's happening, not really behind the scenes, but right in front of us. So when our eyes are opened up to the supernatural, we will start to see things that are operating in the natural, but we'll be able to detect like an investigator or a detective who will find the clues behind what we can see and go, wow, I can see what is ruling here. For example, many of you have gone into a store uh, and you may have been on vacation, you may have been in a foreign country, you've gone into a shop or a store and you just felt some presence that did not make you feel peaceful, did not make you feel comfortable. You felt a presence that was fearful or, or weird or eerie or creepy. I don't know what word you use to describe it, but you nudged your friends, you nudged your spouse and said, I need, we need to get out of here. Something's, something's weird. You are in a physical store or shop or place, but you felt a supernatural presence. Many of you would say, hey, I've been into a haunted house. I've been into a house that was haunted uh, somebody, you know, the, the school or the hospital or the insane asylum or the creepy house. And, and, and so we'll use words like haunted or, or um, you know, there's a ghost there. And so we've been into those places and we felt fear or we felt the presence of something else. Many of the movies on our, on our entertainment channels are all about hauntings and possessions and demons and, and ghosts and... Uh, witchcraft and and uh, I, I even ran across uh, a uh, a movie just the other day I, I couldn't believe uh, I, I forget the title but it was basically uh, the Baal God of the storm the storm God Baal and it was like a b-rated sci-fi movie and I just I could not believe that that the movie was named after the deity uh, Baal in the Old Testament which was worshiped for the weather uh, and this was known as the storm god. And, uh, and, and, and so <clears throat> when we look at supernatural warfare, I want us to see what's right in front of us. And so when we go into a place that we would determine that's haunted, we will start to see, um, we'll start to see or, or to experience or feel the presence of a supernatural presence. Many of you have been in a church service where you felt the presence of God. Many of you have been in the presence of a person where you felt the presence of evil. And so we want to determine how do we survive in this warfare? What is this cosmic battle between these two uh, different uh, uh, kingdoms? And how do we survive and how do we fight on a spiritual, uh, spiritual plane? So let's go into Daniel chapter 10. We Last week or last time, so we're up in Daniel chapter uh, 10, verse 12. Now, Daniel, in the first 11 verses, Daniel has, has been fasting for 21 days. Uh, he's not allowed anything pleasant to eat uh, past his lips, is what he says. So when you hear about the Daniel fast or the Daniel diet, uh, basically being vegetables and fruits and nuts, uh, nothing... Uh, nothing sweet. That's where it comes from. Is from this chapter, and and it, and it comes from uh, what what Daniel and the three Hebrew boys ate in Daniel chapter two, the Daniel fast or the Daniel diet. But uh, in this thing, Daniel sets out to pray for the interpretation of a vision that he has. This is the fourth vision that Daniel has in the book of Daniel, and he needs the interpretation. He, this dream or this vision has brought great uh, uh, anxiety and stress to him. He, he can't comprehend it. 
He doesn't understand what God's trying to tell him. So he prays on day one and says, God, deliver to me the vision. Deliver to me the interpretation of my dream. Now, one of the supernatural things I'd like for you to write down is dreams and visions. God speaks to you through dreams. God speaks to you through visions. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Muslims in the Middle East right now are coming to faith because Jesus is speaking to them and revealing himself in dreams and visions. The Lord speaks supernaturally. If we've dumbed down Christianity to just be about physical uh, uh, relationship with God, just doing the right thing, feeding the homeless, and, and going to church, and if we've dumbed it down to just an intellectual gospel, then we won't believe that statement. But Acts chapter 2 says, In the last days I will pour out my spirit on your sons and daughters, your flesh, maid servants, men servants, old and young, rich and poor, black and white, educated, uneducated. It, it, God says, listen, I'll pour out my spirit and you will dream dreams and see visions. So supernaturally, God wants to give you visions. He wants to give you dreams. Now, not all dreams or all visions are from God. Some of them are just our minds, our imaginations. It's just part of being human. But there's this times when God speaks to you. Well, this is one of the times in Daniel's life. Out of Daniel's 70 or 80 plus years of following Jesus Christ, he gets four major visions that are given to him. He also interprets other people's dreams. But as far as we know, he gets these four visions that are for today end time prophecies. Now, <clears throat> this is a spiritual uh, uh, gift. This is a spiritual blessing. This is supernatural communication. God doesn't typically communicate with a, a post-it note and a letter that you get in the mailbox or a post-it note that is left on the refrigerator. God speaks to us in supernatural ways. So the first 11 verses, Daniel is praying, asking God, petitioning God, I need the interpretation to this vision. But Daniel has been waiting 21 days for God to interpret it to him, for God to tell him what's going on. Let's pick up in verse 12. Uh, verse 12, this angel has visited Daniel, and, and he's basically saying, Hey, Daniel, uh, I have been sent to you. And so he says, then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel. Verse 12, Daniel chapter 10, verse 12. Since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. Who has come? This angel. This angel has been dispatched from God's throne to interpret Daniel's dream. Verse 13. But, Daniel, there was some complications in my journey. But, Daniel, there were some, there were some hindrances on my way from God's throne to you. Now, what we're fixing to see is a glimpse into real spiritual battle, real spiritual territory. Time exists in heaven. So you need to write that down. In heaven, there will be time. Time exists, but God's not bound by it. So there's, there's, there's two distinctions there. Verse 13, but the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, one of the chief archangels, the chief princes came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. <clears throat> this angel basically tells Daniel, hey, listen, God gave me the, the answer, the interpretation. On my way to you, I had to travel through the supernatural territory, the kingdom of darkness. The, Daniel, you're in Babylon. You're in a, you're in a territory that has committed itself to demonic rule and reign. And listen, I came from God's territory, but I had to come through the territory of darkness as an angel carrying God's message to you. And the king of Persia saw me, saw the intruder on his territory, like the Pony Express rider back in the day trying to get through Indian territory, if you will, to get to the outpost. This angel is detained and captured by a fallen angel or a demonic foe. So when we think about spiritual warfare, let's not dumb it down to the degree where we just say, well, you know, God this and the devil this, there's demons, there's angels, there's God and their devil, uh, and it's not really a big deal. 
you know, um, uh, God is all powerful and, and all knowing and he's omnipresent. And, and those things are true, but there's still a battle. There's still a battle that must be waged against the flesh. Jesus teaches us this in the Garden of Gethsemane as we just celebrated Resurrection Sunday. On that Friday night, that Thursday night, Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane going, Oh God, I don't want to die. I don't want to go through the physical pain of, of the cross. I also don't want to go through the spiritual separation of, not, of becoming sin and being separated from you. There is a spiritual battle. Also, when you read Psalms 22, Jesus says, The bulls of Bashan have surrounded me. The bulls of Bashan there are spiritual beings, demonic forces that surrounded Jesus on the cross. So if we could see Jesus physically hanging on the cross, spiritually, supernaturally, there were, or physically there were Roman soldiers and naysayers all around him, cursing him and spitting on him and insulting him. But what was going on in the supernatural? In the supernatural, Jesus is on a cross, and the demons of hell, the bulls of Bashan, what, the, what Psalms 22 calls them, uh, are surrounding him, mocking him, uh, waiting to take him uh, into uh, custody, if you will, take him to hell because he is dying as a sin offering on the cross. So, so spiritually, we've got to see what is going on in the spiritual realm. So we're gonna I'm gonna read these two verses again. Then we're gonna skip over to Revelation chapter 12 real quick. D uh, Daniel chapter 10 verse 12. Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and humble yourself before God. Your words were heard, <clears throat> and I, an angel of the Lord, have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me 21 days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the king of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you, verse 14, what will happen to your people in the future for the, con for the vision concerns a time yet to come. So this angel says, hey, Daniel, I'm sorry. It took me 21 days to get here. There's a supernatural battle that you don't really know about. I was captured. That angel may have made a mistake. That angel may have, uh, you know, we don't know why he was captured. But in warfare, the enemy gets captured. The, ca the enemy sometimes captures us. And it took a stronger angel to come deliver him. Now keep your spot here in Daniel chapter 10. Turn over to Revelation chapter 12. And let's pick up another supernatural scene, a supernatural war scene that's taking place in the heavenlies. Revelation chapter 12. This is not in your notes. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 12, verse uh, 1 through verse, uh, <clears throat> uh, we'll, we'll, read, we'll read the first 10 verses. Now a great, this is Revelation chapter 12, verse 1. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and her head a garland of 12 stars. Now this is representative of the cosmos of the of the planetary, the star system. This is representative of a real uh, physical uh, signs in the heaven. No different than there was a, so a star that led the wise men to Jesus. Verse 2. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dark dragon having seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems on his head. With his tail, he drew a third of the stars and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she bore a male child who was to God into his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. Now those six verses... Are, are, are dealing both in the physical realm of the stars in the heaven, that when we look at, at the stars in the heaven, you can see uh, the stars showing uh, a woman giving birth, the 12 stars, the, uh, uh, this, is, this is the sign of the Messiah. You can also see this red dragon that is trying to devour the child. Now, those signs appear in heaven, but it's also a supernatural reference to Mary slash the nation of Israel giving birth to a Messiah 
and Satan trying to devour the child to destroy him, to prevent him becoming the Messiah or the Christ. So we see that in the life of Mary and the Israelite nation, that the Jews give birth to a Messiah. Herod catches wind of that. He tries to kill all the two-year-old baby boys born when John the Baptist and Jesus were born. We see that Satan tried to devour the child. So Jesus and, his, and Mary and Joseph have to flee to Egypt till he's 12 years of age, or, or for, for about 12 years. And so we can see that supernaturally there's this battle. Now look at verse 7, Revelation 12, verse 7. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. That's indicating a real battle. When Jesus was teaching in the Gospels, he says, Listen, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, but the violent take it by force. He, he's saying, Listen, kingdom of heaven is under attack. Yes, it's under attack. It's under an assault. Satan has rebelled. Satan is an angel. Angels choose. In your notes, you'll see some notes where it says, Angels make a choice on who they submit to. Angels aren't robots. They decide, Am I going to worship God or am I going to worship God? myself or Lucifer? Am I going to follow my pride or am I going to humble myself? So a war breaks out in heaven. Verse 8, but they did not prevail, nor was there a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the world. He was cast to the, to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Now listen, this is a picture of a cosmic battle, a super natural battle. Now what's happened in the church and in the lives of the Christian is Satan does not want you to fight supernaturally. He wants you to just fight in the physical. But until we as believers realize that we are to fight supernaturally, then we're going to lose the war. So let me dive into some supernatural weapons of our warfare, supernatural giftings that God's given us. So go to Ephesians chapter 6. We, we left off here last time. Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 18. <clears throat> if there's a passage of scripture that you need to memorize, you need to know it backwards and forwards, you need to study it, you need to read it in several different uh, translations, it is Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, 10 through 20. Those t 8 to 10 verses. <clears throat> So many believers do not understand that we're in a spiritual battle. So therefore, we read these verses and we go, Oh yeah, the armor of God, that's good for children's church. Yeah, my kids have a little poster on the wall with a Roman soldier. and He's all suited up. And boy, boy, that's really good to kind of you know draw the correlation between a real soldier and a, and a Christian. But I don't really get it. So therefore... I don't really exercise it, so therefore I don't really train. I don't really uh, practice my spiritual uh, um, warfare uh, because demons scare me, and and uh, you know ghosts scare me, and you know I don't really understand the Bible, and so the Satan, so the devil, Satan has filled our minds with complacency, apathy, fear, um, just kind of a a, a a very false picture of the vigilance and the warfare that God's called us to. As a Christian, we are to be vigilant, vigilant, we are to be vigilant in our fight against sin, against the enemy. Satan, every day that you wake up, he should hell should go on alert and say, "Oh no, they are alive again today." Oh no, he is a threat. Just got out of bed. She is a threat to the kingdom of hell today because Cameron's going to lay hands on the sick. Stacy's going to worship uh, God today. Cameron's going to shout the name of Jesus. Stacy's going to pray today. Cameron's going to give some money uh, um, to, uh, into the kingdom to help uh, fund God's kingdom. Stacy's going to go and feed some homeless people. Cameron's going to wrap his arms around somebody and love on them today. Stacy's going to speak truth to them today. Oh no, Cameron's going to is studying the Bible at a deeper level today. Let's just keep Cameron on the surface. Let's just keep Cameron up here in the peripheral. Let's not let him get dick, get deep. Let's make his cell phone ring. Let's make his let's let's fill his calendar. Let's 
Let's distract them. This is spiritual warfare. Now, it may sound elementary. It may sound fundamental. But until we get the fundamentals down, we can't really play in the, in the Super Bowl of spiritual warfare until we first learn how to play the basics of the game. So the basics of the game really start at the armor of God. Now, the Bible says, and we're not going to go through all the aspects of the armor of God tonight, but the armor of God, you can read these verses, and you will see that we are in a spiritual warfare. Paul, who wrote this to the church of Ephesus, he's writing to Christians that live in a place called Ephesus. This could very easily be called the book of the Austinites. This could be written to Austinites chapter 6, verses 10 through 10. 18, where God, uh, uh, you know, two weeks ago, Pastor so-and-so got a download from God and said, hey, Austin, you need to be vigilant. Listen, finally, Austin, be strong in the Lord, the power of his might. Austin, put on your armor of God. This isn't a suggestion. It's not a recommendation. It's a command. If you played football for a, a middle school or a high school, and you were the quarterback, the star player, and you walked out on the field and you said, Coach, I'm not wearing my armor today. You know, those pads, that helmet, man, you know, yeah, everybody knows who I am. I don't have to tell them I'm number eight and I play for you and I don't need my name on, you know, I don't really need shin pad. I don't need uh, guard. You know what? I'm just going to wear blue jeans and a t-shirt because I'm all that. I'm super football. I'm Johnny Football, right? A&M. But, but all of a sudden... We're an easy target. So the coach is going to bench you. He's going to say, you, you're an insubordinate, prideful, arrogant player if you think that you're going to go play on the level that demands that you're suited up. This is not practice anymore. This isn't friendly warfare. They will smash mouth, punch you in the gut, knock you down on your butt, and steal that ball from you, and you will lose the game. Satan is out to kill, steal, and destroy. Now, Daniel knew this. So as Daniel's waiting on his message from this angel, he's fasting. He's praying. He's not whining. He's not in counseling sessions. He's not reading self-help books. He's not over there playing golf going, well, I prayed once 20 days ago. I guess God doesn't want me to have the interpretation. I quit. No, he's vigilantly, vigilantly, I can't say that word. He's vigilant in his praying and fasting, waiting on the Lord, saying, you know what? I will persevere until I get the message from the throne of God. So Ephesians 6 is the basis of our, of our spiritual uh, armor, girding our waist with the belt of truth. Listen, every day... You put on pants, shorts. You, you put something around your waist. You don't leave your house without having put something around to gird your waist because, because you would not expose yourself to the elements or to other people. But spiritually, are we walking around with no pants on, with, with nothing protecting ourselves? So therefore, we're not girded in truth. So we walk around we live this life being deceived, believing lies. The shoes of the gospel of peace. Do we walk around stressed out, fearful, anxious, worried, afraid, prideful? Or do we have on the shoes of peace? Do, when people see you, do they see peace walking into the room? Or do they see pride or anger or, or, or greed? What do they see? What, do they, what, what as you walk around this world in your, in your daily life? Putting on the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith to quench all the arrows of the enemy, the spirit. These are vital to our warfare. So this is step one to spiritual warfare. I know you want to hear about demons and how to cast out demons and, and how to cast out demons out of yourself. And you want you and those are great questions, but until we got our armor on, we can't cast out demons. A policeman can't arrest somebody, even if he's undercover in in you know, clothed uh, in clothes that don't look official. He's still got a badge. He's still got his gun. He's still got his backup. He's still got all of his all of his tools accessible to him. His chief knows where he's at at all times. He's still part of the team. He's not just rogue out there living his Christian life. So we've got to put on the armor of God. 
read this and, and, and engage in this. There are four levels of wickedness. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We, we wrestle against principalities. Listen, America right now is under attack from a principality. Now, a principality is a ruler demon. It's a spiritual demonic force that has rulership. The way that I comprehend that word principality is when we went to school, we had principals. We had somebody, I spent a lot of time, I got to know the principal usually. I spent a lot of time in the principal's office. Well, the principal's job was to enforce the principles of the school system. The principal was given a, a command. The principal said, hey, listen, all students have to be in class at 8 a.m. and out of class by 4 p.m. All students have to score at least a 70 in their class to pass it. All students have to do, the, there's these principles that the school district gave the principal. The principal's job was to enforce the principles on that campus. There's a principality of hell that is enforcing, has been mandated with the principles of Satan. Satan says, go and push these principles upon the American people. Push abortion. Push pride. Push sexual perversion. Push independence. No dependence on God. Independence. Push greed. Push this gluttony. All these things. Push these principles of hell. Cram it down their throat. So these, this principality, there's a principality that rules over Las Vegas. And that principality has sold the lie that, hey, this is Sin City what you do here stays here. It doesn't really matter. You can come here and do whatever you want. You want to sleep around? Prostitution is legal. You want to gamble and drink and debauchery and cheat on your spouse? Nobody will know it. This is Vegas. Anything goes. <clears throat> there is a principality over that city. There's a principality of, of, of deep-seated uh, witchcraft over Seattle, the city of Seattle. There is there is very much principalities that blind the eyes of the inhabitants. This is spiritual warfare. We've got to see it for what it is. Now, it doesn't intimidate us. It doesn't make us afraid. We then know how to operate in the supernatural. There, the Chosen, uh, if you haven't got to watch The Chosen Season 2, it just came out, Episode 1 came out on Easter Sunday. I highly suggest that you download the Chosen app, um, that you um, watch the show, donate to the program. Uh, I think it's on YouTube, Season 1. It's a really cool little scene in there. Jesus and his disciples walk in, and they're going to spend the night at this guy's house. And they've never met this guy, and this guy's reluctant. He doesn't want to let Jesus and his cronies into his house, but his wife talks him into it. So the, the owner of the house is this crotchety old guy, and he says this, this really funny line. It's not in your Bible. This is, you know, a license, artistic license of the, of the producer. But the guy goes, well, I've only got like four rooms, and there's ten of y'all. And the wife goes, don't worry about it. They can all sleep on the floor. They're used to it. And he goes, well, one of the rooms is haunted by my aunt or, you know, my Aunt Susie or whatever who used to, who died in that room or something. So he says, one of the rooms is haunted. So Jesus just out of nowhere goes, oh, I'll take that room. And all the other disciples are like, good, I'm not staying in there. And what, 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 the, what, what, what stood out to me is that nothing intimidated Jesus. So we are not intimidated when we have our armor on. Because God's given us protection. Now that doesn't mean we foolishly, flippantly go out to battle. But we go into battle knowing that, you know what? I don't have to succumb to the temptation, the depression, the opposition, the oppression of the enemy, I have victory in Jesus Christ. So if I'm going to go stay, listen, Stacy and I have stayed in a, in a room where there was a demonic spirit, and that thing attacked me in the middle of the night, and I was like, oh my God. And, and, and I can't remember my exact response, but I'm like, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over this because I was invited to this house so I'm kicking out anything that's not of, of God because I'm supposed to be here. And, and, and God's given us victory over the enemy. That's my point. Ephesians chapter 6. You've got to dig into this and realize we're in a spiritual battle. Second, 
2 Corinthians, on the next page of your notes. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You'll have to read through your notes to, to glean all the information in there. But 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 3 says this. For though Cameron and Stacy, Whitestone Church, you and I, though as Americans we live in the world, though, though, though we live in America, Austin, Texas, we do not wage war as the world does. Now, now, we live here, but we don't fight like them. Um, I, I, you know, I gave some th One of the reasons Judas betrays Jesus is he's trying to push Jesus to fight the Romans. He's like, hey, if he won't do it on himself, I I'll push him to fight back. Peter, Peter, that's why Peter's still on the last day of following Jesus. Right before his crucifixion, Peter's still cutting ears off of people trying to fight. Jesus is like, my, my kingdom's not of this world. I'm going to fight the sin in people, not, not, and then that will change the outward, but not, not the other way around. Um, for the wep Verse 4, the weapons we fight with, just say that out loud, the weapons I fight with, the weapons I fight with, excuse me, are not weapons of this world. We were just told that we don't wage war as the world does, and now we're told the weapons that we have are not from this world. So we've seen horror movies where the, the priest walks in and there's a demon-possessed person and he's got a bottle of holy water and he's got a cross. And, and well, those are weapons of this world. There, there's, nothing, there's nothing holy about holding up a cross. Demons, don't, demons are not afraid of you holding up a cross. Demons are not afraid of holy water. Demons are not afraid if you, you know, I come against you with the... No, they are afraid of the word of God in you used as a sword that cuts their throat. They are afraid of the word of God that's in you that destroys their legitimate claim to the person they inhabit. They are afraid of the weapon of your worship. When you raise your hands, when you shout as loud as you can... When you clap to the Lord, when you dance freely before the Lord, when you humbly bow before the Lord, when you when you lay prostrate on the floor, when you humble yourself before God, those are weapons of your warfare. You've heard me share this story before, but I'm gonna I'm gonna share it. The, there is a powerful weapon when you clap your hands to the Lord. In in Psalms it says, "Enter the courts, enter the Lord's presence with clapping." Shouting, dancing, banging a, a tambourine, banging, uh, making noise for God. The devil's taught us, go to church, be quiet. Go to church, don't smile too much, dress up, wear a really, really tight uh, harnessing suit, and, you know, just sit there with a really good, holy look on your face. And usually that's a frown. No, the devil's told you to be loud at ball games, shout for the cowboys, but don't shout for God because people will think you're crazy. But you will go to the Cowboys football game and paint yourself blue, take your shirt off in 30 degrees weather. You'll pay $800 for your, your center field. Well, that's a cheap seat. You'll pay $800 for the cheap seat. You'll, you'll take off two days of work, and you'll have a, a room dedicated to the Cowboys in your house, and you're not worried about what people think about that. But you won't dare stand up at church and raise your hands. You won't clap for Jesus. You won't say his name because that's a weapon that Satan can't fight against. So when we use the weapons of God's warfare, it cuts the throat of the enemy. And he doesn't like it when we cut his throat. He doesn't like it when we operate supernaturally. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the destroying or the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 4, the weapons we fight in this world, power to demolish a stronghold. Satan does not want you to go to downtown Austin and pray around human trafficking uh, sites. He does not want you to go downtown Austin. He doesn't want Christians on 6th Street on Friday night staying on the street corner worshiping Jesus because he wants that territory for sex, drugs, and rock and roll and his, his oppression. He doesn't want you to go to the abortion clinic and stand outside and peacefully pray and peacefully uh, praise God 
and bind spirits of death and murder. He doesn't want you to do that. Because when you do that, it destroys a, 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 a spiritual stronghold. So it's demolishing a stronghold. Here, here's a good definition of a stronghold. For those of you that grew up in a great family like I did, I grew up in a great family, uh, and, and I knew this. I could go have a really bad day at school. I could, I could uh, get beat up. I could get made fun of. I could fail my class. I could go visit the principal another day. Uh, I could come home from having a really rough day, but I knew this. I just need to get to the stronghold of my house. If I could just get home, it's a safe place for me. Now, some of you say, Cameron, my house was not that. But you may have gone to a friend's house or a grandparent's or a neighbor's house, and that was a safe place. There, or a coach or a, 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 a person. We have safety strongholds. Jesus tells us in Zechariah, return to the stronghold of hope. Get out of the waterless pit. Return to the stronghold of hope. There are likewise demonic strongholds of sin. And we've tried to defeat them in the flesh. We've gone to counselors. We've gone to, to, to physical uh, uh, places to destroy those strongholds. But God says this stronghold is a spiritual one. It's been in your family. It's been in your generations. It's been in your life since day one. It's a stronghold that you got from your mom or your dad. It's not. It's a sinful stronghold. We need to break it. Well, how do we break it? We break it through spiritual warfare. So God says, listen, you've got to fight with spiritual weapons. Verse 5, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we, verse 6, will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once our obedience is complete. Listen, there are weapons. Here's some of our weapons. Tithing is a weapon. Oh, preacher, talking about money. Man, I, you know, listen. <clears throat> the reason that, that I will talk to you about money is because there's a spirit of poverty on some of your lives that is robbing you of your financial blessing because the devil has convinced you that you can't give God the first tenth of everything that you make, the first tenth of your profit. God says, listen, tithing is a spiritual weapon. Uh, to talk again about the Chosen movie, if you watch the, the Dallas Jenkins, the producer of that, of that series, he says a year ago the Lord told him, hey, listen, give this show away for free. Now, it costs him tons of money, million dollars to to do all that TV stuff. I don't, I don't understand it. But he said they, were, they used to beg people to give. Then they gave the show away for free, which cost them a lot of money, and they made more money that, and had more money to produce season two than they ever needed. The point is they gave what they tied. They gave to God what was his, and he'll take care of our needs. Fasting is a weapon. Fasting is not a weight loss program. It is a, it is a denying yourself of that which you need to survive or to live and trusting in God for a short period of time. So if you don't fast, try it for one day. Try it for one meal. It's skip lunch and say, God, or, or just eat vegetables for lunch tomorrow. Eat something healthy and say, God, instead of going out with all my coworkers, I'm going to go to my car and I'm going to pray for an hour. And I'm just going to eat a minimal amount of food. And I'm going to fast this time for you. Maybe fasting for you would be no television for a week, no Facebook for a week, no social media for a week, no, uh, and, and you pick no sugar for a week, whatever that is. Fasting is a spiritual weapon. Clapping, shouting, dancing, singing, worshiping, speaking scripture, memorizing scripture. These are weapons of our warfare. And a gun, the other soldier is really good at flying a plane. The other soldier is really good at hand-to-hand -hand combat. The other soldier is really good at strategy and, and, and uh, uh, understanding how to attack the enemy. God's gifted you in specific ways to utilize you as a warrior on his army or in his army. And your role is vital. It is vital to the kingdom of God. If you don't play your position, somebody else has to play it. And somebody else is, going, does, is not going to play your position 
as well as God designed you to play it. So read through this. Uh, worshiping, bowing, clapping. Um, uh, these are weapons of our warfare. Uh, verse 5, when it says, demolish the arguments and the pretensions. Listen, the arguments uh, against us are that, hey, God doesn't really care how you live. Just do whatever you want to do. He loves you anyways. Uh, um, God didn't really create the world. Science has already proved that the world's billions of years old. Uh, God didn't really create it. It's just a good, it's just a good feel-good story. You know, all, all the, the, the Bible's in error, or the Bible's full of errors and mistakes, and, you know, you can't really, it's not really the Word of God. It's just a historical account. Listen, all those are, are arguments against the knowledge of God. So, so Satan is fighting against us in that way. Let, let me just say this, and I, and I, I feel like, um, uh, well, I'm not off target. Spiritually, Satan, to build the beast system that will fool the world, deceive the world, he's already doing that through social media. He's already doing that through the mainline news propaganda that we are consuming. He's already deceiving the world with arguments against God, arguments against uh, morality, arguments against truth, arguments against uh, um, God's word and God's message. Jesus Christ is God, and Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Jesus Christ is the Jewish Messiah who has already came, he's already lived, he died on a cross, and he rose three days later, and he will return for the Jewish people as their Messiah a second time. The enemy wants us to believe that Jesus is one of many prophets, or one of many ways to heaven. Jesus himself said, hey, listen, there's going to be arguments against what I say, but I, Jesus, say... I am the truth. I am the way. I am the life. No man comes to Father God, Yahweh, uh, Jehovah. No one comes to the Father but through me, Jesus. See, this is a message for the Jewish people. It's a message for people that are putting their trust in Allah or Buddha or, or a Hindu God or a, a, a yoga or some sort of Eastern meditation or we're putting our trust in our good works, uh, us just being good people, or Joseph Smith. We're putting our trust in these other things. And God says, these are, these are arguments against me. God says, we got to demolish those strongholds. Those are spiritual strongholds. And until we fight them on a spiritual level, we'll lose the war. Keep going with me. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 12. And uh, we won't be able to get through all this tonight, so we'll pick back up on our next <laughs> session together. But there are spiritual gifts, there are spiritual positions, and there are spiritual ministries that God's given to us. So I'm going to go through this uh, a, a little bit quickly, but we'll dive back in starting here next time on, on, on 1 Corinthians 12. Now, look at 1 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 12. Now, God would not be very fair to us if he says, hey, listen... You're fighting a spiritual war. Hey, here's some armor. Hey, you got some weapons, but this is how I built you to fight. Now, um, I'm trying to think of a good analogy or a good parallel. Um, there are, uh, <clears throat> for example, basketball. Uh, I'm, not a, I'm not a huge basketball fan. I don't really uh, know the game in and out. Like I, I know baseball better. But basketball, we'll use basketball as the analogy. Um, there's a big argument out there. Uh, who is the best basketball player to ever play? Michael Jordan or LeBron James? So you got LeBron James fans uh, and Michael Jordan fans. But, but here, here's, here's, what, here's the facts. Both of them are world-class, top of the, of the, of the game. Out of, even, out of all the professionals, they're top of their game. So those two guys play basketball better than 99.9% .9 of anybody else in the world. But they play very differently. They have different styles. They have different ways. They have different mannerisms. They have different giftings. But yet they still can throw this ball into a hoop 
and make points like nobody's business. So spiritually, we'll take that with us. You have a Billy Graham who spiritually did things this way, but you had a Mother Teresa who did things this way. Now, don't let me lose you before I say this. Billy Graham impacted the world this way, preaching and being an evangelist. Mother Teresa, I don't know that she ever preached. I, I don't know uh, of any time that she stood up and, and preached, but she served people one-on-one -on -one in some of the poorest places in the, in the world, and she taught them the love of Christ. Billy taught them the love of Christ in a very public way. She did it in a very private way. They're both top of their game for the Lord. They gave their lives to the Lord, but they're gifted extremely different. So when we look at spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, God's called you to the army. He's put you in the game. He's given us all the same uniform. He's given us all the belt of truth, all the breastplate of righteousness, all the helmet of salvation. So we're, we're much like a football team. We all got the same jersey. We got the same kind of helmet. We got the same shoes on, the same knee pads, the same, you know, all the stuff. But one of us is a kicker. One of us is a quarterback, one of us is a lineman, one of us is... So we have different positions, and we're gifted very differently. So when we look at spiritual gifts, what Satan has taught us and tried to convince us is, oh, these gifts, they don't exist anymore. Yeah, these gifts ended with the first uh, church when the last apostle of Christ died. Uh, these gifts died. Satan does not want you to believe in the gifts of the Spirit. He doesn't want you talking in tongues. He doesn't want you getting words of wisdom. He doesn't want you prophesying. He doesn't want you laying on a hands. He doesn't want you doing miraculous things. He doesn't want you interpreting tongues. He doesn't. He wants you to think that this is charismatic craziness. Only those crazy Pentecostals over there do this stuff. You know, those, those wackos over there. No. This is normal practice, normal warfare for the believer. So let's read 1 Corinthians 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, put your name here, brethren, Whitestone Church, Cameron. Now concerning spiritual gifts, I do not want you to be ignorant. 1 Corinthians 12, 1 says, do not be willfully, choosingly, uh, um, unknowing about this topic. Do not be ignorant about spiritual warfare. In other words, if you don't know anything about spiritual gifts, spiritual warfare, the Bible's telling you that's not acceptable. Learn it, dig into it, because without it, you will die. Without it, you'll be ineffective. Without it, you will be the easiest target for Satan and no threat to his kingdom. Um, verse 2. You know that you used to be a Gentile carried away by dumb idols wherever they wanted to lead you. The word Gentile there would mean an unbeliever, lost. Somebody that was just chasing the world. You used to be really good at studying the ways of the world and operating in the greed, operating in lust, operating in pride, operating in anger. You used to be really good at cheating and stealing and conniving. You were the best drug dealer on the street. You were the best crooked business person out there. You used to lie like the best. You used to be really, you learned the craft or the trade of cheating, deceiving, lying, and stealing. But we want it as believers to be ignorant. We, we, don't, we, we just think that these gifts are just going to be given to us. Listen, you don't just one day wake up and preach like Billy Graham. You don't just one day wake up and write books like a Francine Rivers. You don't just one day uh, go lay hands on sick people like Oral Roberts. You've got to practice your gifting. You've got to learn your talent. You don't just walk into the gym one day after working out for one day and look like my friend Todd Hendren the next day and lift 500 pounds like it's no big deal. You don't just, you got to learn it, work it, and, and, and stay diligent with it. That's the same with spiritual gifts. Verse, verse 3. Well, we're, we're not to the spiritual gifts yet. Verse 3. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, there are diversity of gifts. So, highlight that in your Bible. Verse 4, diversity are differences of gifts, but the same Holy Spirit. So, that, back to the LeBron James, Michael Jordan. There, there, 
there, there are uh, diverse ways to play basketball, but it's the same game, same objective. Throw the little ball into the big hoop, score more points than the other guy. I don't, but, but they, they, they got differences, different giftings. There are differences of ministries. There's different in NBA teams. One team's called the Bulls. One team's called the the Lakers. And that's about all I know. The other one's called the the Mavericks. I mean, they got different teams, different players, different teams, and there are a diversity of activities. They don't all play the same position. There's five positions on a basketball team. But it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to the prophet of all. So we're going to have to pick up there next time because we're going to we're going to run out, and I don't want to rush through this. But but this is what I want you to dig into this week. When we talk about spiritual warfare from Daniel chapter ten, spiritual warfare is real. There was a real angel captured by a fallen angel, and it took another stronger angel to come war against that king of Persia to, to set the prisoner of war free, to set the POW free. Daniel's part in that was praying and fasting, believing and worshiping God. What you do on this earth impacts the heavenly realm. What you do impacts the spiritual battle. We're not even, we are on the field with angels. What we do impacts what they do. When you physically gain physical territory for God, it has spiritual implication. Um, when Jacob laid his head on a rock, the Bible says it was a place, a place called Bethel, Bethel. And as Jacob laid his head on the rock, uh, it, we, we get the terminology Jacob's ladder. Well, he has a dream, he has a vision of angels descending and ascending on a ladder that is connected to the physical piece of property that he just happened to stop and sleep at that night. That's a physical portal into a spiritual realm. God desires for us to take territory. God desires for you to have that job at that office, in that position, not just because you're going to get a bonus and a raise, but because he needs you physically in that space to usher in, to open up a supernatural door for the gospel of Christ to be spread or to be spoken about. God needs you to move and sell your home because he needs you to inhabit the house down the street or in another city or another state or another nation or another country. He specifically designed you to go move into that territory. So as we talk about spiritual warfare, I want us to remember this. You have armor. Ephesians 6, study that between now and next week. You have a, a battle plan in, in 2 Corinthians that God is encouraging us to fight supernaturally. Next week, we're going to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the positions, Ephesians 4, verse 11, uh, the fivefold ministry. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Those are positions. And we're going to talk about the fruit and the gifting of the Holy Spirit. So God has designed you to fight supernaturally, not just fight spiritually. I mean physically or naturally. God's designed you to be a threat to hell. So until next time, study uh, those passages. We'll wrap up Daniel chapter 10, head into chapters 11 and 12. But God bless you. Thank you so much. We'll see you next Tuesday here at 630. Tomorrow night, also online, we have a, a 6.30 uh, Whitestone Church a Zoom Bible study on uh, spiritual warfare if you want to be a part of that. God bless you. Uh, oh, and we will have in-person services this Sunday at Whitestone Church. God bless you. Thank you.